Ezra Sashem, this Baruch, this should be uh, the beginning of um, the beginning of a uh, good thing where we're trying to talk a little bit about the uh, about the lesson for Rav Chaleimah, Rav Shlomo Al Yashiv. Hold on, I'm just going to ask. Okay, the say there. So, the lesson for Rav Chaleimah, Rav Shlomo Al Yashiv, was. First and foremost, what would make him probably most familiar to many people, he was the maternal grandfather of Rav Yosef Shlom El Yashav, the previous, you know, Gadol Hador, uh, really Gadol Hador, somebody who was from a previous generation, Mamish, the videos of Rav Yosef Shlom El Yashav, learning Torah inside, in his room by himself. And it's a, it's a real wonderment to see. Ad Kedekach, that when people would watch videos of uh, Rav Elyashev learning, almost he would speak out loud, but it was just very much a stoic position, bent over his gemari, he must have been in his 90s at this point. So Rav Yitzhak Maya Morgenstern Shlita, when speaking about the need for a person to have a chavrusa, we know the significance of having a chavrusa, that in order to bounce ideas off of, a chavrusa and misusa, right, someone who's sitting in their singularity and isolation, you're not part of the yishuv, and so he said, so how can we see certain tzaddikim who learned on their own? And he said that when a tzaddik learns on their own enough, or they engage in their mind enough, it's as if they are chavrusas with themselves. There's a back and forth, a, a splitting, so to speak, of the self to the point that it becomes a, a, a relationship with the self. And he says, Haraya, you listen to Rav Yashav learning, and you see that he was mamish speaking out loud. So Rav Yashav was literally one of the gedole, gedole hador, and, and from a previous generation. When Rav Yashav had a relationship with his grandfather, he was very close with him, when the Leshem decided it was time to come to Eretz Yisrael. So the Leshem wanted to get to Eretz Yisrael, and we're going a little bit backwards in the timeline here, but we'll get there. Leshem decided he wanted to come to Eretz Yisrael, and a few years before that, when Rav Kook, Rav Avram Yitzhak Akon Kook, was a, a burgeoning rabbi in, in, in Europe, so he had asked his kehila for a month off to go and learn with the Leshem. The Leshem did not have a yeshiva, but he did serve as the point at which so many people would come to learn Pinim Torah. We have, historically speaking, Rav Yerucham Levavitz of Mir, Rav Eli Lopian, different, the Chafetz Chaim, different tzaddikim went in order to learn under the Leshem. Rav Kook was one of these, to the extent, and I'm biased on this, but I believe that in order to properly understand Rav Kook's teachings, one needs to really understand the Leshem's teachings. Although, you know, I'm more than happy to enter into that discussion, but Ezra Sashem. After developing a lifelong friendship, there was continued letter writing between the two. Rabbi Yashiv <coughs> reached out to Rav Kook asking to come to, to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, the Leshem was born in 1841 and died in 1924, and I believe it was within the last 10 years of his life or so, or, or maybe 20, I'm not 100% sure, that he made his way to Eretz Yisrael. He settled in the old city of Yerushalayim, or, or close there. And Rav Kook would spend time with him. Rav Arya Levine, Slus Yogan Aleinu was his shamish. Rav Arya Levine was the Leshem shamish, and Rav Arya Levine's daughter... I'm forgetting the connection now. Rav Levine's daughter, granddaughter, married oh, yes. Rav Yashav, right? And Rav Yashav had a very deep connection with Rav Kook's writings. There was a famous time where he was very frustrated with, with publishers that wouldn't publish Rav Kook. And, and so the Leshem made it to Eretz Yisrael. At this time, the Leshem was finishing up his writings of his various farm, which we're going to go through, which are all titled under the grand title of Leshem Shmo Ba'achaloma, which are the three stones on the third row of the Kohen's breastplate of the Choshen Mishpat, Leshem Shmo Ba'achaloma, and we'll discuss why that might be. But the Leshem had just finished writing something called Sefer HaKlalim, which was on the last farm he wrote, and he writes at the end of the introduction there that at this point I cannot, cannot see nor can I write on my own, but these words were written after my kind of conveying of these words to my grandson. It doesn't say who, but at this point Rabbi Yashav was, I believe, uh, 16 years old. So Rabbi Yashav was writing and a scribe for his grandfather already at the age of 16, and we're talking about some of the deepest farm available. The story goes that when Rav Yashav and the Leshem made it to Eretz Yisrael with Rav Yashav's father of Avram Yashav, who was the son-in-law of the Leshem, that the Leshem took his grandson, Rav Yosef Shalom, out to the Kinneret in order to drink from the uh, proverbial well of Miriam. The Be'er Shal Miriam, 
is known as a place. The Eros Shemiriam, we see Rav Chaim Vital, Sfusio Ganelenu writes that the Arizal also gave him to drink from the Be'er of Miriam, and the ability to drink from the Be'er of Miriam opened up the capacity for awareness, Hasaga, and Rabbi Yashav says that his grandfather Leshem did the same thing for him. So who was the Leshem? What was the Leshem in the grand history of the development of Torah itself? So the Leshem Shuvah Vachaloma was somebody who studied in Tells a little bit. He went to Tells. He was known as Rav Shlomo Lafine, um, who was known as an Eloi. But at that time in Tells, there was an unidentified kind of teacher of his. Surprisingly, this teacher, who may or may not have been, you know, one of the tzaddikei nistarim, this is how it usually happens for people. You know, they say the chazanish learned by somebody named the Kasavo Baker. There was a group of the painter, the sandler, there was the chaban. These were all a group of, of hidden. The chaban was the youngest of the group who just recently passed away. So there were always hidden tzaddikim who went around teaching. The Leshem was introduced not only to the teachings of the Arizal, but the first book he was introduced to were kind of like the practical manuals and meditations of the Arizal, referred to as Sharua HaKodesh, permutations of names, very often seen as the last station along the growth process of learning Kaminiya Satora, and the Leshem was introduced to that first and foremost. At that point, somehow, someway, the Leshem really becomes one of the clearest, most rarefied and unique expressions of interpretation and commentary on the Kabbalah of the Ariza. So before we can go to the Leshem, we really have to begin with who the Ariza was. Now, the grand history, and we're not going to go into the grand history of anything, we're going to do an overview, but if we look at the growth process of Panemius Satora, right, we talk about Panemius a lot here in this year, we're going to be identifying real stations along the process of Panemius. This is not going to be sheer on the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov, although everything that you'll ever hear from me is all within the framework of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. But the Svarim can trace, right? The Bris Menucha, a famous and very important Sefer, and other Svarim have done this. They can trace the transition of Panemius to Torah tracing it back to Matan Torah, that Moshe Rabbeinu, we are, are fully aware, was not only... Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rebbe of Klai Yisrael, in terms of Niglo Satora, he was the he was the person who was the Navi Hasodos. The Lubavitcher Rebbe would refer to as Mashiach, based on the Shonas and the Ramam, as Navi Hasodos, the Prophet of Secrets, which is obviously rooted back in Moshe. Moshe and Mashiach are really two iterations of the same soul, because Mashahayo Hushiya, that which was will will be, that's the Roshe Tevos of Moshe. So Moshe was the teacher of both the revealed Torah and the concealed Torah. Then it went underground for a long, long time. Let's bring it back to after the Nevi'im. Obviously, the Nevi'im were doing something very significant in terms of Yorda and Merkava and real engagement in the development of prophecy along with the Nevi'im as the Tamidim of the Baal especially the Pia Setzna or Rebbe Hashemim Famdomo likes to point out were yeshivos for Nevi'im, right? There were methodologies for this type of spiritual education to cultivate the mind to receive kind of that inner experience. And, but let's go to kind of the, the Rishonim already. So we have, we have Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor. Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor, and it's very important for the, the notion of Sagi Nahor here, Rav Yitzhak was blind, not dissimilar to Yitzhak Avinu, who also was referred to as a Sagi Nahor when his eyes stopped seeing. Yitzhak Sagi Nahor, Sagi Nahor is a euphemism. It's a euphemism because the blindness there is identified with a certain over-inundation of light. Right, to say that he doesn't see, but how are we going to say that he doesn't see? There's too much light. Sagi Nahor means there's too much light. And in truth, that's what happened with Yitzhak Avinu. And that's what happened with Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor as well. But the fact that Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor, who, and this is important, we could speak about Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor for a long time, but one of the things about Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor was that he was blind. When it comes to the intellectual, graspable, revealed notions of Torah, our relationship is one of vision. The, the ocular-centric positioning of wisdom, which is I see with the mind's eye, enlightenment, illumination of the mind, vision is something that is graspable, seeable, I can hold it, I can understand it. So that is very clearly associated with what we might refer to as the expressible, provable elements of a revealed Torah. When it comes to the inner teachings of Torah, one who attempts to engage these teachings with the mindset of intellectualism or the light of the intellect alone. Now, the intellect is fundamental, but if you base your experience of Primiya Satora only on the light of the intellect, the person will not come to understand anything. 
So the origin of Panimiya Satorah comes from a place of Rav Yitzchak Sagi Nahor, a recognition that you have to let go of the need for absolute identification of evidence, which is associated with vision, and embrace a certain inner hearing. You'll see that the system of the Arizal starts only with a conversation about hearing. All of the metaphors are about an inner audio logic. It's not about seeing. Greeks is about seeing. Yitzhak Sagi Nahor is teaching us that you want Panimiya Satora, stop trying to see things clearly and learn how to listen internally. Rav Yitzhak Sagi Nahor had a, a Talmud, and his Talmud was Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona. Now Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona, from the space of Gerona, 13th century Gerona, was a place of burgeoning expression of Panimiya Satora, still within the framework of the philosophical language associated with Rambam, right? There's the grand... Machlokas, not really Machlokas. Textual history dictates that the Rambam did not have access to Zohar, that the Rambam did not have access to the inner teachings of Torah. There's a statement from the Abarbanel, which was turned out to be a ziyuf in the end, that the Rambam at the end of his days came across these ideas of these writings and he reneged on what he wanted to say. So Rav Tzadok, you know, doesn't follow that path. Kamarna doesn't follow that path, although that doesn't stop them from aligning the Rambam with Pinimius HaKabbalah. It just means that Ruach HaKodesh is Ruach HaKodesh. And, you know, it depends on the language you have. It doesn't make so much of a difference. But what the Leshem does with the Rambam is something fundamentally unique. And we're going to get there. But Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona was still in the language, in that framework of a philosophical language being used to describe paradoxical ideas. And really, I use the word paradox deliberately because if there's going to be something that's going to mark the territory of Panimia Satora, especially as it is codified and expressed throughout what we identify as the two main sources of Kabbalah, the Ramak, Rav Moshe Cordovaro, and the Arizal. These two luminaries, one was a planet within a solar system, one was a solar system unto himself, and one was not better or worse, it was just a Matthias. But the, the gateway is paradox. The gateway is the willingness to suspend this need for the logic of non-contradiction. Right? This Aristotelian laws of logic which dictate that if A is not B and B is not A, then A and B cannot fundamentally be true at the very same moment in the same postulate of thought. That is the contradicted middle, middle the excluded middle, as well as a law of non-contradiction. Panemia Satora not only gets rid of that law, but they crown themselves with the willingness and the ability to move in and through that law of non-contradiction to uncover the truth of the matter. That paradox is the language and the logic of the system. Well, again, what we're going to see is that the whole system of Panimiya Satora is it's subversive to the degree that it is providing a system of thinking, which when you get to the core of that system of thinking, the system of thinking begins to self-erase. Meaning if you follow the logic of Kabbalah to its nth degree, the logic of Kabbalah is an impossibility because there's nothing but godliness. Yet at the same point, we are continuously holding on to the very fact that there are gradations and worlds and levels and partitions. So it is kind of like this impossible idea where we're developing a system, we're developing a system, but it's a system that is perpetually at risk of falling away. Does that make sense? I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in, in grandiosities right now, so we'll kind of come back to Rabbeinu Azriel of Corona. So there's Rabbeinu Azriel of Corona who becomes the Rebbe of the Ramban. Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona is the Zerim of the Ramban, which is where we really begin to see a differentiation away from Maimonidean kind of logical associations, Aristotelian, Bukhulay, and we begin to see more of an openness to Panimiya Satora. I'm going to skip uh, immense amounts of time. You know, there's people who are much better trained and educated to convey the history of these ideas than I, but what arrive at the Ramak. The Ramak is functioning in Svas, and the Ramak is really the grand codifier. He has taken all of the various streams of Kabbalistic thought that existed in the hidden pathways of influence from Moshe Rabbeinu, like the Bris Menucha traces it down, through the Shvatim, through Levi, through you know, all of it, and, and, he, and through the Goinim. And he collects all of the different opinions and basically creates an orchard which is a combination of all sorts of different fruits, but at the same point, it's capable, it's an orchard that's capable of growth. It's a pardes remote, meaning it's an orchard, a collection of previous ideas, but it's this collection of sorts in this orchard which still allows for a real final fruit, a remon to come out. The Ramak collects, he compiles, and creates pathways that help us identify which 
which opinion really becomes foundational to belief in the monotheism or the mystical monotheism of Yiddishkeit, and, and at the same point, you know, which ones to disregard as well. That's the Ramak. The Ramak, in his Pardes Ramonim, and the Ramak had various stages of his writings. The Ramak was, was an Isha Zohar, right? The Ramak, we know of the Ramak's Pardes Ramonim. What less people know about is the Ramak's Ilema, which is really a, a really very clear introduction to what the Arizal is going to be basing himself off of. The Ramak also wrote about 20 volumes of Or Yakar on the Zohar Kadosh, which basically are engaged in practical engagement with wandering around the fields of Svat in the hopes of uh, uncovering, you know, angelic conversation. Like the Ramak was everything, everything, until the Arizal showed. The Arizal was was a light, a luminary that descended into this world, one of the unique ones of the generations. The, the Arizal came with the capacity to create or reveal a new language. Now what the Arizal was revealing, what was based on his own mind and, and his own perceptions, this gets to the core of kind of the literal versus metaphoric conversation about what Kabbalah actually is, which maybe we'll begin to get to tonight. The Leshem is really a manda amar when it comes to what the Arizal's language actually is. And the Leshem has a famous machlokas with those who study the Ramchal too heavily. And the Leshem says, relax, I published the books of the Ramchal. This is not about the Ramchal. But the Leshem has a very, very delicate, fundamental way of understanding what the Arizal was doing, which is why I think it's such a healthy introduction, as we'll see. But the Arizal comes along, and basically the Ramak passes away. I always I thought this in Svat once that in Svat once that the Ramak osios Ramak are marak. It's like a soup. It's a soup that kind of serves as as an appetizer to what the appetite for the full meal. Now the soup is not the meal, but the soup is a fundamental element of the meal. The Ramak paved the path, and not to God forbid minimize the, the, the it's a soup that's a meal with neatzmo. But in relation to the meal of the Arizal, it's considered a soup. That the Ramak compiled, he paved the path, and the Arizal came along and developed a new language. A language that was rooted very, very much in a number of places. It was rooted in the Zohar HaKadosh, fundamentally. It was rooted in three areas in the Zohar HaKadosh, most importantly, the Idra Rabbah, which was the first time Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai gathered together with his students outside in the granaries of Svat. Um, there, a few of the Chavraya died because of the, the ore that they experienced. And then there's the Idra Zuta, which is the smaller gathering, which was on the death day of Rashbi, where the seven students were remaining, and that's what many people read on Magba Omer. And there's the Safri Ditzniusa, which is what the Gra refers to as the Mishnah, basically, of the Zohar HaKadosh, which the Gra and the Leshem sees himself as the fourth stage from the Vilna Gon, as we're going to see. They took the Safri Ditzniusa to be fundamentally binding, not in comparison to the Idros, but the Safadit's news is fundamental, and the Tikkune Zohar. And the Arizal also utilized the language from Daniel to describe certain permutations, but the Arizal comes along and reveals what we identify now as what we refer to as Kabbalah. Kabbalah Sa Arizal. Kabbalah Sa Arizal is a systematic approach to the creation of the world, the formation of the world, the functioning of the world, the teleological end and the redemption of the world, the purpose of the world, and the process of the world. As many tzaddikim have pointed out, you know, like the Arizal is really probably one of the, the clearest and, and perhaps only fully comprehensive theology within Yahudas. Right? It is a, a fully comprehensive perspective of every element of the Torah that does not deviate one iota from any of the other elements. Right? The, the story of the Arizal is, is an incredible one. The, the Arizal is born in Yerushalayim, and then he becomes a student. He, he travels to Svas, he travels to Mitzrayim to be by his uncle. I'm, I'm forgetting whether he was a student of Rav Betzal Ashkenazi, the Shittim Kubetzes, in Mitzrayim, or whether it was before Mitzrayim. I think it was a yeshiva in Mitzrayim. And in that place, on the banks of the Nile River, which is a somewhat surprising thing, which is kind of the polar opposite of what Kedusha is, the Arizal is misboided. He spends hours and hours and days upon days in his boininess and contemplation, in his boininess and solitude and speech, and deeply davening and learning the Zayar HaKadosh day in, day out, d demanding the Zayar offer itself to him. And he was Zoycheh to Giloy Ediyahu, which is a halachically binding concept that we see, right? There's certain shitos in halacha that take the words of the Arizal as a Navi. 
right? Because there's a gile Eliyahu there, and it, there's a there's a fundamental element towards this system. The Arizal comes after he leaves Mitzrayim. He comes to Svas, where so it's Yerushalayim, Mitzrayim, Svas, very similar to the system that the Arizal describes, which is light, which is Yerushalayim, shattering, which is Mitzrayim, and then a redemption of light and a doubling of the light, which is Svas. So it's a descent away from clarity into this clarity and then coming out with a doubled level of clarity, which is the Marav Tuvcha Shet Safanta Lareyecha, that the hiddenness of Svas, that airy quality of Svas, which takes this ground and elevates it back up to Shemayim. So the Arizal gives us a system. How that system develops, we are not going to go into, but suffice it to say that the main student is Rav Chaim Vital, Schusio Ganalenu, identified as the singular student given permission to and allowed to convey the teachings of the Arizal with the help of Rav Shmuel Vital, who was Rav Chaim Vital's son, and Rav Meir Paparish and Rav Yaakov Tzemach. What we uncover is basically what we identify as the library of the writings of the Arizal, the Shmona Sharim, most importantly, Eitz Chaim Kadisha and Otsur Chaim. That is, and then there's other Talmidim of the Arizal Maharisaru who goes to Italy, it's a different story, but that is the system of the Arizal. The reason we're not going into the details is because the Leshem gives us the Arizal and more. At the time that the Arizal's teachings were, were coming through, were coming through, so, so first and foremost, the Arizal's teachings were, were, were massively misunderstood and and misutilized and, and destroyed and shattered and weaponized at a certain point in history, especially with regards to Casa Arura, and that's a whole nother conversation, but you know, the, the fear that people may take these teachings, the, the most common question when sharing Panimiya Satora ever is people's questions are, but what happens if I allow myself to relax based on these teachings and perhaps I'll, I'll come to not have any proactivity in my life. Like if I'm trying to convey Hasidus, right? Baal Shem Tov says to be calm. Oh, but, but if I allow myself to be calm, maybe I'll misuse that calmness and I won't do anything. So I'm always wondering, and this happens across the board, everybody's concern is that armed with this willingness to judge myself positively or favorably, the, the natural assumption is I'm going to misuse this somehow and it's going to lead to something negative. And I'm wondering why this is, and I think it's really because like there was a point in history where these ideas were so traumatically misutilized that's built into the fabric of these ideas that that's a natural fear. That people are afraid of mistrusting themselves and using these ideas of acceptance and comfort and our missions and all the positive things that Panimi and Satoru offer and people have a natural traumatic fear of accepting them because they're afraid they're going to go off. But we have to trust ourselves that, you know... So taught about the secret of Jewish mindfulness, we're not going to spend 24 hours a day in it. We're going to hopefully spend something like five minutes a day in it. And the natural occurrence of the day is not going to want to go be makr of a korban on a bama outside of Yerushalayim, right? That's just, we have to forgive ourselves a little bit for that. Then, after that shvira, so then, nahar yoytse me'eden. The nahar of the Arizal leaves Gan Eden and it breaks off into four different heads. There are four different heads, four methods of in the interpretation of the system of the Arizal. Now, I will own my biases. I see the Baal Shem Tov as the guiding kind of principle that allows a person to then properly learn the Grah, the Ramchal, and the Rashash, but my bias is Baal Shem Tov, and that's, a, that's in my blood, and you know, it's not, a, it's not a, a superiority thing. But, um, but these four Zeramim are as follows, and they all kind of live in the same time period, the 1700s, mid-1700s or so. And so what we have is Rav Shalom Sharabi, the Rashash, who was the father of the Temani and Svardi process of the interpretation of Kabbalah. We'll go into that in a second. Then there was the Vilna Gon, Rav Elio Kramer, who was the father of kind of Misnagdik Jewry, although that, I mean, he himself was referred to as Hachasid, so Misnagdik is somewhat of a, you know, a, a directed term. There was the Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, and the Padua school. And then there was the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. These four interpretive schools, each and every one of them, were commentaries and utilizations of the system of the Arizal. One can really argue, as many people bigger than I have argued, that these four individuals, these four tzaddikim, can be identified as the fourfold process of hermeneutic textual interpretation, pshat, remez, drash, and so, the pardes of understanding something. The pshat level of the Arizal is the rashash. The rashash, and again, the rashash has 
significant Talmidim. There's the Beit El Yeshiva where the Rashash came to be. The Rashash's Talmud Mufak was Rav Chaim de la Rosa, uh, the Torah Chacham, which is the name of Rav Vichemayer Morgan, Cern Shlita's base Medrash. There was the Shem and Sasson. There was the Chida. There was, there was the Me'il Eliyahu. There was the Be'er, there was the Ben Ishchai. There was, uh, um, Rav, Rav Shlomo Eliyahu, Rav Mordechai Eliyahu's father. There were, it was the, the Bal Hasadeh, right? There were Rav, Shol, Rav, Shalom, Rav Shlomo Dweck, Rav Shaul Dweck, right? Shaul Dweck, the Bal Hasadeh, right? So there were, there, and, and now the, the Svardi Mikubal and Yeshivos, they, they abound, and the Rashash has undergone a revolution over the last 20 years or so. It's been happening for longer, but Ashkenazim started learning the Rashash, which means that the Rashash was now being utilized as a bridge. And this is really what Ravitchemeyer does in a way that is, I believe, fundamentally <coughs> unique, that the Rashash becomes the bridge that allows us to translate the writings of the Arizal into the terms of the Baal Shem Tev Kadosh. But we'll get there. That's the Rashash. That's Oime Kapshat. The, the Svardim learn what the Arizal said. They are not interested in what anybody but the Arizal had to say. And again, that really means Rav Chaim Vital and Rav Yisrael Sarug. The Rashash writes in, in a letter to Chachme Amara that in the beginning of Hatnam Asrachav Asanar that he had come across you know, some of the books that were written by others and he tore Kriya based on what he saw. And so there are Mikubalim in our generation. People in our generation wanted to say that the Rashash was talking about the writings of the Ramchal, Chas V'Shalom. Ravit Shemaya writes, he says, when I read that there was somebody in our generation who thought that the Rashash was tearing Kriya for the Ramchal, I tore Kriya on this guy. Right? So, so Halila the Chas, the Pashtad Pshat is that Rashash did have access to probably some of the writings of Kasa Arura, especially through the Shomer Amunim HaKadmons, Rav Yosef Igris' real engagement with those writings. But that's the Rashash. Then... It was? Amazing. Learning it properly, right. It was learning it as like, it was taking it as a Torah Shabbat Shabbat. The Ariza was a Torah Shabbat Shabbat, which demanded breaking one's head over the textual discrepancies. And the Rashash, no one like the Rashash, uncovered principles that enabled the system to function. Principles that rest at the core of everything, which are relativity principles. That and If you look at the Eitzchayim, if you look at the writings of the Arizals, each shar, each detail is something different, then you're never going to be able to overcome the Stiros. But if you realize and you take an abstractive look at it, there's a deep form of abstraction here. It's a lambdas of a certain kind. It's an oime kapshat. It's meaning it's like a chafetz chayim type of lambdas, you know, where it's like, just let me understand what Rashi Tosfos are saying so I can understand what the Gemara is saying. It's not let me fall into fancy pilpulim. It's that these things have to make sense and there's a development of tools, mechanisms, technologies of Kabbalah, erche hakinuyim, different ways of understanding it that really open the system in an amazing way that reduces it to simple principles. Then we have... Then we have... Your article is from you talk about the Kabbalahs. The Kavanos of the Rashash, absolutely. So so in Arizal, in Arizal, so there's two Zeramim. There was Eitz Chaim, which was basically the teachings of the Arizal, or the, I don't want to use the ontology of the Arizal, it was the framework, the system itself, and then there was the pre Eitz Chaim. And literally, the Tzadikim point out, right, that the Eitz Chaim is meant to be a way to partake of the pre Eitz Chaim, meaning to say, or Shara Kavanos, which is the practical engagement with these ideas as applied to the daily engagement in Torah and mitzvahs. Now this process of kavanos is probably the polar opposite of what we would refer to as kabbalah ma'asit. Right? Most people are still stuck in the idea that the application of theoretical kabbalah into action is kabbalah ma'asit or, or magic. Kabbalah ma'asit is not something that is available anymore. It was. It was. Rav Chaim Vital was engaged in it. There were books written about it. There are books that are published on it. There was real engagement. The Leshem, more than really anybody, but also the Tamidim Hagra and the, the Kamarna Tzadikim also, they, they kind of came out fully like the buck stops here. Anybody who's claiming any relevancy to these things you know, is not is not speaking in the name of Kedusha. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a hidden process of Tzadikim engaging, but it means that it was no longer part of the public discourse. Kavanos are taking the concepts of Eitz Chaim, which are categories of thinking about how Hashem created the world and what that process is, and, and identifying it in the process of tefillah and mitzvahs. 
So tefillah and mitzvahs were no longer just the bare words themselves or the bare content themselves, but they were vehicles that carried an intensity of meaning and an intensity of engagement, which not only gave them deeper insight, but the act of kavanos was an active participation in the unfolding of what the ideas were. Meaning to say, the Arizal says, what does it mean to have kavanos? So when I'm davening Shimon Esrei, and if I'm thinking in the first bracha of Shimon Esrei about all of the different couplings and separations and severings and disconnections that lead to connection and false starts of connection that lead to, to more desire for connection until a moment of clarity, right? So all of those things, when a, when a normal person or, or when a person is davening Shimon Esrei without a single intention, they're doing the same exact thing. They're davening to the same exact God. They're davening to the same exact place. The only difference is the Arizal says that if you have the kavanos, it's as if you are the one causing all of these things to be taking place. The, the relationship in reality is a simple one. It's action from below initiates expression from above. Isarusa dilatata and isarusa dilaila. We know this. We have desire for an influx of Hashem's light in our lives. And as a result, and in accordance with that desire, Hashem reveals Himself to us. The Kabbalah, or the, the, the Kabbalah of the Arizal adds in that system infinite mechanisms that are all really simple rules that separate or stand in between how above comes below and how above, above, gets, uh, how below gets above. So if I'm learning the manual and I know how it works, and I'm paying attention and I'm aware of each detail of it, so I have engaged in the process in a more refined way of more self-awareness. It doesn't mean the person who has no awareness of what's happening is not getting the same thing. It just means that I can now benefit from knowing every stage. And the more stages I experience, the more wondrous it all is. Because the same wonder here is the simple question at the heart of it all is how does the infinite express itself as something finite without losing its infinitude and without that finite thing becoming infinite again? How is this impossible balance struck between bilti gvul and gvul, between the limitless and limitation? That's the question. That's the question Kabbalah is coming to answer. The more mechanisms I become aware of and interrelating parts, the more opportunities I have to see the wonder of it all. Versus someone who's approaching it from a particular way. So the Sidurim of the Rashash, the Arizal wrote Shara Kavanos, going through each mitzvah, each, each moed, each experience. What the Rashash did was, was really take the, like let's say the Shara Kavanos expresses a year-to-year process. The Rashash came and said, nope, this is found in every bracha. This is found in every Shemona Esrei. It's found in every day. The whole year's process is found in each davening. Then the Torah Sachem comes along and he says, no, 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 forget about each word, it's found in each letter, it's found in every breath, it's found in every glance of the eye. Right? So that's, and, and what we have is a, the textual production history of all of the different books and Kavanos of the Rashash, which has, again, seen an enormous, enormous, enormous increase in the last 20 years than it has ever seen. These things were always there, but when Hasidim would get the Siddur Rashash, when Rav Shalom Belzer got the Siddur Rashash, he put on Big Day Yantif, and he went out and he cried over those pages until they bore holes in them. Nowadays we have them on any device we want. That's just the nature of the game. But all of when you look in the Siddur HaRashash, what you see is when the Arizal says this name of Hashem is spelled out this way, he does it. It becomes a visual process. Now obviously, if there's a visual aid to it, that just adds to the necessity of refining it and never, God forbid, getting stuck in the textuality of it. The whole thing is how can I try and represent HaKadosh Baruch Hu while at the very same moment realizing that any actual representation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is absolute Avodah Zara. This is, the, this is the grappling at the heart of it. How do I represent that which can't be represented? And the only way to do that is to represent it in a way that's not true representation. And that's what the Siddur HaRashash is in an esoteric abstract way. And so then you have, any, any questions? I'm more than happy. I know I, I tend to... Uh, any questions on any of this, Bichlal? Okay. So then we have Remez and Drash. Remez and Drash, or Drash and Remez, are always kind of intertwined with each other. Even in the Arizal, there's a question which one corresponds to the second letter of Hashem's name and which one corresponds to the third. But these two schools of thought are typically identified as the Vilna Gon and the Ramchal. The Vilna Gon is seen as Remez, whether that's surprising, we'll see in a second, and the, and the Ramchal is seen as Drash. So let's look at the Ramchal, because that's a, a simpler one. The Ramchal was a, a Giloy Men Shmaya Mamish, 
a giloy from Shemayim in what he did and what he saw himself as doing. And the, he gave us Masil Sisharim. So if the Var Kol Neshma, he also gave us Derech Hashem, Adir Bamarom, Tikkunim Chadashim, Taktu Tfilos, Kinas Hashem Tzavakos. Real, I mean, the Ramchal was just mamish. And the best thing about this was that the Ramchal suffered externally so intensely and lo ichbat lo bechlal. He cared. He avada cared because he had what to reveal. But by the end of his life, when he was writing Masil Sisharim in Amsterdam, when the Redifos had gotten so, right? Is that the... By the end of his life, he was writing Mesil Sasharim. That's where he began to identify as Rabbi Akiva. Right? That's where he's like, at this point, this is all with Gamzu, the Toiva, everything. And that, in the, in the pits of despair, he gives us Mesil Sasharim. The Ramchal had a Talmud Mufak, who he identified also almost as like a Talmud Chaver, which was Rav, Yaak, uh, Rav, uh, Rav Yaak, Ram Duvali, Rav Moshe David Vali. Rav Moshe David Vali, Skusya Genelenu, is just... Uh, one of the most incredibly expressive, creative, fully fully unpacked systems of of Kabbalistic interpretation. Ram Duvali was a doctor. What? Well, yes, yes. And now people are going to his kever. I think now people are. You just what? Amazing. They're publishing a svarim more. Of Yosef Spinner, Shlita, who should live and be well, is, is publishing more and more of a svarim. They just came out with a three parish, not just, but they came out with a three volume parish on Tehillim, which is all about Geula. Ram Duvali was like not afraid. He was darshaning why this house in Padua had this shaped roof and why that cross looked this way and why they're smoking tobacco and they're making guns and why they're making knives and everything. He darshaned everything. Everything in the world said darshan. He also had a very clearly systematized process. Ramchal also had another student, Rav Yikutiel Gordon, who well, the three of them were fundamentally important. We're finding out now that Rav Yikutiel Gordon likely wrote Klach Pistei Chachma, and he even wrote an earlier edition of, of, um, of Das Tvunos. But again, none of this takes away from the, the light and the glory of the Ramchal. This was a this was a chabura. The commonality here is the Rashash had a chabura with rules and regulatory definitions of what it meant to be a friend to each other, to daven for the other person, not to talk when learning, to always be learning. The Ramchal also had very similar bylaws of what it meant to function within the chabura kadisha of the Ramchal and to bizocha, to giluyim, etc., etc. Then you have the Vilna Gom. Now the Vilna Gom is, is by far the most robust and, and full expression of, of a commentary on the Kabbalah of the Arizal. What well, you have in the Vilna Gon, Vilna Gon wrote so much on Kabbalah. He wrote so much. It's Perish on Safradit's Nusa, which now with the, with the tzaddikim that we had, like Rav Elia Weintraub, has, has become an open book. Rav Moshe Shapiro, they made this book an available book. If a person wants to understand Safradit's Nusa with the Bir Hagra, you just have to buy the right book and have patience to read it, and there's nothing that can't be understood. But he wrote his parish on Safar Ditznusa, he wrote his parish on Tikkunei Zohar, he wrote his parish on the Hechalos HaZohar, he wrote his parish on, on Mishle, he wrote his parish which was written by his Talmud of Menachem and the Lushlov. And he also wrote Lekute Hagra and, uh, and Hadras, Hadras Koidesh, which Rav, Rav David Kamenetsky has done a lot of incredible work in kind of the manuscript work of the original writings of the Gra. The Gra, there's a chilek between the Talmidim who saw the Gra and who didn't see the Gra. The Masorah is that if you saw the face of the Gra, you became a Talmud in Kabbalah. If you didn't see the face of the Gra, that was not necessarily the Zerim that you picked up on. So famously, we have Rav Chaim, Rav, Rav Chaim Velazhener. Nefesh Chaim is, is really one of the most incredibly comprehensive Svarim available to us. The, the Bekiyas and the Gaonis and the full control of of every Nakuda and a clear description of what he was describing. It, it, Nefesh Chaim is an incredibly important sefer. Rav Menachem Mendel of Shklov, and also Rav Yisrael of Shklov. Shklov was like a mystical place. I'm not sure like it actually existed in this world, but Rav Menachem Mendel of Shklov was was the most was the hardest. The Rav Akiva Erlinger, one of the Talmidim of Hakim of Rav Itchemeyer, the the son of the the Birchas Avram, Rav Avram Erlinger, says that Rav Menachem and Lushkov's writings are by far the hardest ones. But his parish on the Idrizuta, Mayimadirim, his parish on he was a mathematician. His gematrias are are you know mind boggling, but very delicate, very very teeth ideas. Um, so he wrote a commentary on something called Raza de Meim Nusa. He wrote a parish on Sefer Hatmuna. He wrote a, a biur on Chalakim and the Zohar. And Rav Moshe Shapiro pushed to have all of these writings published. It's an amazing thing. He wrote an amazing parish on the Idrizuta, which is called Maim Adirim. And it's an incredible Sefer. And there's a Haskama from the Divrei Chaim of Tzans. It's an interesting thing. Today, I believe, is the art site of the Divrei Chaim's son, Rav Baruch. 
with Baruch, right? Not the not the Shinover, but but the, but. So why did he have the Sefer? Why was the Divrei Chaim holding a, a Misnagdik a commentary? So so what what I saw from the Rebbe Rav Itzimai writes that there's a teaching in Rav Menachem Mendel of Shklov's Bior that says that. You know, Bechol Yom, there's a baskel that comes out from Har Cholrev, which, which is Goyrim Hir Hurei Tshuva. And the same question is asked by Rav Menachem and Shkov, where, where is this voice? Elama, it's the Hir Hurei Halev. It's the thoughts that emanate from the heart of the individual on the day-to-day basis. And Rav Menachem Mendel of uh, the Divrei Chaim knew that teaching as a teaching from another Rav Menachem Mendel, which was Rav Menachem Mendel Vitebsker. And so he thought, okay, Rav Menachem Mendel is quoting this teaching, I'm going to keep the Sefer until, but what we know is that he had the Sefer on his desk every day, and he would look a little bit at the Marim Madirim. So you have Rav Menachem Mendel Shklov, you have a Talmud of Rav Menachem, so Rav Menachem Mendel Shklov is considered Pesheni to the Vilna Gon, the second generation of expression of the Vilna Gon's Kabbalah. Then you have Peshlishi. Peshlishi was Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver. Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver was... A goin atzum, a tremendous posek, especially in areas of Eben Ezer in, in his time. But the comprehensive approach that he had and the ability to write and convey ideas in, <coughs> in a clarified and clear way is, is really unlike anything other than Rabbi Nassim's Lekutei Alachos, the way the Leshem writes, the way the Mitla Rebbe writes, just this exactitude and flow, a, a willingness to express, 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 but never deviate from the essential Point. Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver wrote Pischei Sharem, which is a two-volume introduction to the Eitz Chaim, which is a incredible, incredible and clear sefer. He also wrote a parish on the Ijarabah, which is called Bris Oilam. He wrote a parish on the Hechalos. He also wrote Perushim on Perushim. So he wrote a parish on the Kutei Agra. He wrote a parish on the Mariam Madirim. So Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver has given us an immense amount. He wrote Magin Betzina. He engaged with philosophy. He had a Talmud who is not considered the fourth, ma- the, the fourth mouth of the Gra, but certainly considered part and parcel of it. It's Rav Yitzhak Kellner. Rav Yitzhak Kellner made Aliyah. He set up a yeshuv in Yerushalayim. He wrote a three-volume sefer called Toldas Yitzhak, all about the Beis Mikdash. But the Leshem Shobov Achaloyma, who is very, very much removed generation, generationally, identified himself or is identified as the fourth mouth of the Gra, Perevi'i, to the Vilna Gon. The Leshem was a Talmud of the Vilna Gon. Why, how, he comes from that place familiarly speaking, but it's not necessarily clear what exactly, you know, what, it was just his chinuch. His chinuch was, he doesn't, he doesn't engage with Hasidus. I've gotten into the argument with, with other people who were writing on the Leshem, that the Leshem was like this staunch misnaged who couldn't tolerate Hasidic teachings. Bechlal. Adarabba, we, we don't see this at all. He doesn't express it, and the Leshem fully expresses his issues. He expresses his issues with people learning their Ramchal too much, and he also quotes twice from the Tzadikim of Kamani. He quotes the Zohar Chai from the Kamani Rebbe, and he quotes the Orinayim from the Kamani Rebbe's son. I was also told that that's not such a raya, because that's not really Hasidus, that's Kabbalah. But nevertheless, the Leshem was a misnagid in the sense that he was a Talmud of the Vilna Gon. What that means is that the Leshem was not willing to allow the Vilna Gon's Shitos in Kabbalah to deviate from the Shitos in the Arizal. One of the things that the Talmidim of Rav Shneir Zalman of Liadi and different people from the camp of Hasidus and Rabbi, Norman, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb points this out very clearly in his, in his amazing uh, doctorate, the Torah Lishma, and the Machlokas about Torah Lishma in Nefshachayim and, and Tanya. But he, he makes very clear that one of the, the polemical tools, and perhaps for good reason, was that the Gra did not take the words of the Arizal as seriously, chas v'shalom, as the Hasidim took the words of the Arizal. Because there are places in the writings of the Vilna Gon, in very delicate, delicate places, where the Vilna Gon is cholik on the Arizal. Which, when you know the Vilna Gon and what he was about, meaning the Vilna Gon would be cholik on anybody, right? For the sake of that mess, for the sake of getting back to the truth. But Khalila and Chas to think that the, the Gro was Choylik on the Arizal. Rav, Rav Yitzhak Isaac Chavir writes in this introduction to Pitzvei Sharim, and the Leshem expresses this as well, our job is to realign the two, to show that the Gro was deeply in line with the Arizal and really, and, and really allowing different textual discrepancies to become seen from a greater lens. Everybody with me on this so far? And then, and, and so that's the, that's the Leshem. 
And then I, I would argue that you have after that, you have, you know, Rav Chaim Friedlander, Rav Dessler, although Rav Chaim Friedlander, Rav Dessler, Rav Moshe Shapiro, these are all kind of Zeromim from the Leshem. And, and then you have the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. And the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, I mean, we're, we're not going to get into the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, but that was the, the fourth application of, of Kabbalah. That was the, the sod of it all. And so just a little bit about the Leshem and what he was trying to do. The Arizal did not leave a clarified system. The Arizal did not live as long as he wanted to live. As we know from his engagement with Rav Chaim Vital, he wanted to live two more years. He wanted to live till the year of, of Shin Lamed Vav, I believe, which was a year of anticipation towards Geula. But he passed away in Shin Lamed Gimel. And which is why, don't be afraid that the Arizal died in the year Shaleg, Shinlam Gimel. Because there's going to be two more ways that the Arizal's teachings are going to be fully clarified. And depending on which bias you have, that could be Baal Shem Tov and Rabbi Nachman, that could be the Vilna Gon, and that could be the Leshem. But the, the Arizal system is filled with textual discrepancies, right? There are Chesur Mecharas Vahachiktani, if it's true in. In, in, in Niglo Satoira, as Rafutner points out, it's not a, a bug, it's a feature of Niglo Satoira, that there are textual discrepancies, all the more so the system of the Arizal, because you can't convey through textuality the simultaneity in which things are actually taking place. So the system is difficult and there's theros. What the Leshem is, is a Rav Chaim to the Arizal. The Leshem looks at the system of the Arizal with the mind of Tosvos. He's not a Rashi. He's not a Rashi on the Arizal. He's a Tosvos in the sense that the assumption is is that every place that the Arizal writes something needs to be seen in the grand context of a, a singular village. Right? So what is said in one house can't be in contradistinction to another house. Again, with all of the prerequisite textual kind of disciplines of what true writings were what, and what not true writings were, which was a real part of the process of the unfolding of Kabbalah Sa'arizal. But the Leshem took the system as a unified whole, which meant that if there's a discrepancy, a textual discrepancy, a stira, a contradiction, what we need to do is uncover the source of it and figure out how there are two dinim, tzvei dinim, in one element. Very similar to the Rashash. The Leshem and the Rashash can be seen as the completion, so to speak, of the Arizal system. It is taking the system of the Arizal and it is re refining and defining what the Arizal was saying. The Leshem is not trying to, God forbid, say anything new. The Balasulam also was finishing the system of the Arizal and the Balasulam was also not saying anything new. The Balasulam had a relatively different language that he was willing to use, but he was also part of the conveying of the teachings of the Arizal. The Leshem was fully engaged in trying to clarify and more significantly bring these ideas down into a place of relevancy. To a place where when I think about these things, when I learn about these things, it's not so much about how can I apply them to my life in a psychological way. It's not so much how can I abstract these ideas into metaphors to understand how God engages in reality. For the Leshem, it was learning it. It was learning the ideas. This is a chetza of Torah. Panimiya Satoru, the language that the Arizal gave us, is not a happenstance language. We believe in the Gile Eliyahu that the Arizal had, and we believe in the language that the Arizal had, the same way we believe in the Gile Eliyahu that Rashbi had, and the way that we believe in the Lashon of the Zohar, and the same way we read the Lashonos and Shir Hashirim as as not simply metaphors in need of being discarded for the sake of the inner kernel, God forbid, but understanding that I don't know what these words mean, but I believe that these words mean something fundamental. The fundamental piece is the study of the text. When I'm learning these ideas, says the Leshem, they're happening. By learning the ideas, the Leshem is a student of the Gra in the clearest way because it's about Torah Lishma. When you're learning the Sugyos, that is the Kiyom of the Sugyos. It's not necessarily about the psychological inversion of the ideas. That's true also in the Leshem. But the Leshem was trying to convey what the Arizal beheld. The Arizal was a Giloi. There's nobody like the Leshem who takes the Arizal seriously. His problem with the Ramchal is that, or those who study the Ramchal too much, is that if you want to say that the Arizal is a metaphor that needs to be understood in the context of divine governance, this, that, or the other thing, so then what happens to the Torah of the Arizal? How is this any different than philosophy Ba'alma? The Leshem sees at the heart of the Arizal Giluyim, textual Giluyim, in the same way that a person can read the writings of the Zohar HaKadosh. And without understanding them, there can be a belief in the mechanism of Kedusha's text. 
the Kedusha Satex, the Segula of the Torah, to have an impact, even when I don't understand them, the Leshem sees that in the Arizal. And that is why the Leshem is so fundamentally in, engaged in ensuring that the Arizal system is clear and understandable. And not only that, but Misha Tam Tam Ha'itzchayim, Tam Tam Gan Eden. That's what the Leshem says. It also happens, and I'll come in a second, that the way the Leshem understands the system of the Arizal, I personally believe is one of the most therapeutic and philosophically, cognitively beneficial ways of shifting one's awareness in this world to the degree that if a person learns Leshem properly, or not even properly, if a person reads what the Leshem is writing, it's really difficult to be the same type of person. You see reality differently. You see experience differently. You see struggle differently. The Leshem was very much engaged in the sugya of struggle, of gvuros. He saw himself as coming from Shevet Dan. Shevet Dan, we know, is the Shevet that was kicked out that was kicked out of the uh, out of the cloud. Givat. Givat. Um, first off, I'm not I'm not ke- uh, halavai one day to teach the rashash. Um, I mean, again, Ravitch Meyer's Svarim on the rashash. It's op- it's an open book. I Meaning, there's no you can't a person can't claim I can't understand anymore. Right? It's just you know like unless you can't read Hebrew, but even that's changing. Right? It's being translated into English. It's all revealed. Mamish, in the healthiest way, the, the books are so clear. But for Rashash, a person needs more of a familiarity in the concepts of the Arizal already because the Rashash is truncated. It was not his way to reveal secrets. He wanted to keep it on the text. It was more pal pe and, you know, Tachazi, come and see, come and taste it, do the work. <coughs> the Leshem, he explains, as we're going to see next week when we begin the introduction to this text, is um, he, he says you're going to come across terms that you're not going to understand. But I can't, I can't explain those terms without utilizing those terms. So be patient like any beginner and reader. The Leshem literally, in, in this Sefer, Hakdam Sushar, the Leshem holds the hand of the reader to the point that <coughs> by the end, you've almost been tricked. You think you've gone through a starter's guide, but you will never be able to like to, to shift the way the Leshem has taught you how to learn how to learn Pnimi Sator. I believe this is probably the fundamental introduction sefer. Usually after, I, I like to recommend the sefer from Rav Moshe Shatz first, but Lav Dafka is that what has to be learned by everybody. The Leshem, the Leshem gives you everything he's describing. There is no assumed knowledge prior. There's no assumed knowledge necessary. The Leshem, just in the, in the last few minutes, the Leshem wrote... Really, for, the Leshem's Avoda was writing. He was Tovel before he set up his ink. You know, there's stories of, of you know, meditative writing. He refers to himself as a pen in the hands of God. His writing is incredibly, incredibly evocative. He carries himself away in his writing. He didn't have Talmidim. He had people who stopped by his house. But I think one of the reasons the Leshem, the Hashkacha, didn't have Yeshiva is because his Avoda was to write. And the Leshem really gives us a full comprehensive system of writings. So there were four Svarim that are all referred to as Leshem Shoei Vachloima. First, there was Leshem Shoei Vachloima, Drushe Olamatohu, which is all about Shvira Sakelim. The first volume is about the mechanics of it all, the details of the Arizal. The second volume is a deep dive into the history of humanity, the story of Adam and Chava, the story of being kicked out of Ganeid, and the story of what happened there, Arba Shinech Mesut Apardes, Dora Midbar, Mitzrayim, Yitzias Mitzrayim, Matan Torah, Miyot Talavana, Mamish, some of the most beautiful, you know, Rav Moshe Shapiro and his base Medrash are based fundamentally on these ideas, to the point where Rav Moshe allowed, along with Rav Yashav, to publish the writings of the Leshem with the Kabbalah aspects removed, and if you read the Hakdama to this book, Shari HaLeshem, Rav, Rav, Rav Yashav and Rav Moshe Shapiro are basically saying, like, Hara Asha, right? Nobody's going to understand anything, but we need to give the light of the Leshem over, so we're going to do this thing. Um... The Leshem also wrote a, a sefer called Sefer HaKlalim, which is Klali Hispashtus Vistalkus, which is really about the, the dual pulsation at the heart of everything, an expression outwards, a regression upwards, but when something gets expressed, it leaves a trace of itself below, the return back down into that trace, the reinvigoration of that trace with a newfound experience, and the unfolding of reality in that process. You know, it's like two that is four. It all corresponds to Yud Kevav Ke. Then there's Sefer Aburim, which is the commentary that the Leshem began to write on Eitz Chaim. We have about 400 pages of it, and it's only on the first four Sha'arim of the Eitz Chaim Kadisha. We also have the Hagos of the Leshem, 
on um, on the Tikkuni Zohar from the Grah and the Safedis Nusha from the Grah. There are also Mikhtavim that are coming out, or if Moshe Shatz has been engaged with those very much with regards to his Sugya in Simsum, which we'll discuss in the Ramchal. And then there was Hakdamu Sushaarim. Hakdamu Sushaarim was the last Sefer written and the first Sefer published. Hakdamu Sushaarim was basically a marketing campaign. The Leshem was, was looking for money to get his books published. It's a crazy thing to think about. Like he needed, he needed money. He's like, I've got this, so what am I going to do? He wrote seven Sha'arim that comprises the sum total of the system of the Arizal in a systematic way that is identifiable in each and every way. It's like fractalized. Incredibly clear. And he writes in the Hakdama that I don't fully understand how there can be a time where people are claiming that they don't have to learn Pinimi Satora. This was his, his issue. At this time, whether it was because the, the students of the Vilna Gon had not continued, right? He's generations after Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver, but at the same point, he's picking up the mantle of you know, the real sturdy vision of Kabbalah Sagra, Mashiach Ben Yosef, things like this, and the light of Shklov, and the Leshem is picking up and saying, how can you guys claim to be Rosh Yeshiva and Bekiyam and Shas without knowing a basic element of Kabbalah? One person, famously, historically, there's a lot about whether the Leshem actually met Rabbi Sosalant or not. Strange amount of scholarship on this question. But the story goes that the Leshem told Rav Yerucham Levavitz that he was afraid that if he met Rav Yisrael Salanter, then Rav Yisrael Salanter would tell him that you have to stop learning Kabbalah. So Rav Yerucham apparently repeated this back to Rav Yisrael Salanter. Does that make sense that Rav Yerucham would have seen Rav Yisrael Salanter? Conveyed it back to whoever it was that he was conveying it back to. I think that's how I saw the Maisa. Could be wrong. But, and, and, and Rav Yisrael Salanter was famously saying, he was saying that, you know, it's never been my job to tell anybody what to do. I just, what, what, how can I care about what's happening up there? I have to care about what's happening in here. But Hakdam Sushaarim, he utilizes a svara from, the, from Rav Yisrael Salanter. He says, if you have no time to learn Panimiya Satora, this book will take care of that for you. This book is a beginner's guide that will convey everything. And then he says, and once you learn this book, you realize you have a lot more time to study. One last Nakuda, and so this is the real introduction. This is a Hakdama and a Shar. One of the important things to keep in mind is that the Arizal never stops being a Hakdama. They're still referred to as Hakdamas, Hakdamas of the Arizal. Because in the end of the day, all of the learning in the world is just a segula to a giloy that a Kaddish Baruch Hu gives to a person to understand a little bit of what these tzaddikim meant. And that happens with learning through Bittal and Kedusha and Tara, b'chule, b'chule. But, but the Leshem writes in Sefer Adeya that Rabbi Sol Salanter himself said that Bishnas Tafresh Ba'ama in 1840, Right in the sixth millennia, there's going to be an unfolding of wisdom, an inundation of wisdom, and at that point, people will come to realize that even a child can study Kabbalah. That's the Masorah that the Leshem brings from Rabbi Sosalanter. He says that about the year 1840. The Leshem Shabbat was born in 1841. So Bezra Sashem, I believe fully that the Leshem is a kiyum to this Havtacha that everybody will have access to Pnimiya Satora, and Bezra Sashem, that's what we're going to be learning together.